Emma Lacey and I'm the Senior Director of Biodevelopment across Amir at OpenX. It's great to be back at Advertising Week Europe and what an extraordinary 12 months it has been. We've all experienced unprecedented change personally and professionally. So it's my pleasure today to be joined by Sean Odenay, Managing Director of Matterkind. And today we're going to talk about the impact all this change has had on the digital media landscape and discuss what this change means really for brands and media agencies in the future. So, Sean, tell us before we dive into the, the proper questions, tell us a little bit about your role and Matterkind as a business. Hi, Mark. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm Sean Odenai. I head up the team in UK and Ireland for Matterkind. And Matterkind is essentially IPG, the dressable arm. Um, and, you know, we service all IPG agencies when it comes to addressable media. And, um, you know, we're seeing uh, a lot of, of growth and a lot of momentum happening in IPG in this space. And, um, and I'm really excited to be with you and talk to some of our client examples today. Well, you've also had a name change in the last 12 months, so uh, it really has. Exactly. exactly. So the title of this session, you know, we're talking about fast changing digital media ecosystem. There's a lot in that. Um, can you help me unravel it? Um, you know, give me your perspective on what change you think has been going on. Um, you know, are we actually seeing more change than ever before? Or, you know, does it just feel that way because our circumstances have changed and there's lots of big topics of conversation going on in the market? Yeah, it's a really good question when you think about change. And uh, I'll probably start off with, by using the most um, used word of 2020, unprecedented, right? That's what we're seeing now. We're seeing an unprecedented change, and a lot of that probably got to do with privacy. You know, take a step back and think about the last couple of years. ITP1, ITP2, TCF1, TCF2, all the IDS changes, the recent iOS 14.5 change, right? That's a lot of change, right? But couple that with that little thing that happened last year, and that, that was still in the pandemic, which is probably called the greatest change. And our daily movement. Um, have changed and in turn that's affected uh, I guess advertising medium take me for example pre-COVID pre-COVID I would start my day at 6am 6am commute to the office I'll, I'm walking to the station I'm on my mobile phone gaming emails Instagram you name it right? I go past my in my local station and you've got the digital home screen onto the train stop off at London Bridge again Another did right home screen. Onto the train to Farringdon, on my phone, still browsing, Farringdon, another did right home screen, and into, into the office, and then repeat for five days, right? Um, fast forward to what it's like now. 7.30 start this time, right? So a bit of a sleeping, which is good. 10K runs, 10K runs, uh, not every day, but most days, uh, quite slowly as well, I must say. <laughs> I said slowly. Um, and I guess I'm on my jog, listed to my Spotify premium, and I see maybe one digital album screen on top above my little. Get home. And I'm now in my room, or this room, in back to back team meetings all day. And this is a fundamental change in how users are interacting with advertising. And this, there's, there's the obvious question here, right? What do we do about it? The change in consumer movement really uh, requires us to be agile. And using programmatic out of home in this example that I gave you on my job for a consumer like me is, is kind of exercising that ability to be agile where you can activate uh, against, against consumers when they're on a move services. But you know, when you look at the pandemic, it's, it's, you know, it's changed the way users are consuming content. I remember reading an article uh, on Advertising Week. And it was headlined something like, um, what was it again? Um, daytime TV um, usage soars amongst um, at-home workers. And not only did this create additional, um, I guess, options for brands and consumers, it really gives us a new reality. Take my wife, for example, right? She clocked Netflix. She watched every show on Netflix, absolutely clocked it. Um, and while that's, I guess, funny to some degree, it, it, it almost paints a picture of kind of where we're at now and the, the, the different dimensions of how consumers are, um, I guess, consuming content and what that means for our new reality. And that new reality is, is that, you know, users are no longer understanding that 
value trade of advert to free content because they're so used to these different applications like Netflix, Netflix, um, Spotify Premium, Disney Plus, you name the rest, right? All content where they're consuming with no ads. So I mean, it's, it's, it's premium content as well. So like they want the very best in entertainment and, you know, they want to consume, you know, the most exciting shows and they don't want to be disrupted in their experience of it. You know, we've totally exactly yeah. from Linux. Exactly, yeah. So, so we're using, to that point, so we're using getting that ad free um, experience without disruption, right? Uh, coupled with all these privacy changes and all these opt outs and everything, it just adds that level of complexity where you know, users don't really understand, therefore don't trust their data in the hands of brands. So you know what, Emma, when, when I think about this, I really feel like there, there should be two things that we're doing right in this space. And the first is that I think we need to take a, a real deliberate and respectful approach to reach and communicate with the audience. And uh, why do this? We do this at Matakan. And we've kind of branded this whole concept, uh, conscious marketing. And the idea of conscious marketing is that it begins with empathy, where we can really understand our audiences and share stories. But empathy then leads to, I guess, action, when we can create messaging that goes with that audience, right? That then leads to action. And then that action leads to a business outcome. That's the first thing we should be doing. And the second thing we should be doing, which is quite timely, actually, before I go into the second thing, is um, just recently, over the last week, one of, someone on my LinkedIn po posted their Apple's new announcement they had a video which essentially spoke about their AT, ATT, App Transparency Tracking, I think it's called. Um, and it was all about educating users about it. And if I be honest with you, it had a quite negative undertone. But what they were doing, they were trying to educate um, kind of consumers about tracking and targeting. And to my second point, that's what I think we need to be doing. As an industry, we need to come together and educate consumers about how we use their data. So they're confident in our ability um, to deliver relevant advertising. Not necessarily do that Apple with it, because it, like I said, it had a negative undertone, right? But we need to be able to do this right so consumers understand that value trade, right? A lot of these privacy concerns that lead to these opt outs all is eventually just going to lead to irrelevant advertising for consumers, right? And that's not what normal, right? I'll give you my last personal anecdote. I, um, my electricity and gas bill last year was astronomical. And that was partly probably due to the fact that we're at home all day, right? Um, um, working from home, yeah. the heat is on, etc. And it's been very but cold. I remember, <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I'm a cheapskate, so I sometimes work with the heater off and I've got blankets and hot water bottles. And, but I, I remember speaking to a friend of mine who lives at the end of my road. He's got the same size house. I said to him, how much do you pay for electricity and gas? And he told me. I thought, why is mine so expensive? And he, he kind of said, who am I with? And I won't say who I was with, but it was one of the top five. And he said, that's probably why. So I did what probably anyone would do. I went on a comparison website, found another vendor, found Octopus Energy, and that's not a shout out or a plug. I worked with them, and so far, so good. Um, but you know what really frustrates the life out of me is the fact that I got YouTube probably daily, and I'm browsing YouTube, I'm looking at videos, and I'm always seeing Octopus Energy ads, right? And what are those Octopus Energy ads? They're trying to convert me. And while, on one hand, that just means they need to get better at understanding their first party data so they can understand how to suppress me, but what it does, what it, what it, what that illustrates to me, it it illustrates the new reality that we could live in. Frustrating, right? A reality where users just get irrelevant advertising because of all this change. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a really interesting sort of problem, really. You know, on the one hand, customers and users don't want to be advertised to; they find it disruptive in theory to the content they're trying to consume. But at the same time, they, you know, they want advertising to be super relevant and you know they don't want to be sharing their data so you've got all these issues kind of going against each other mm -hmm. and i think you know the market is trying to clean up the system i mean it leads us very nicely on into you know the elephant in the room which is third party cookies you know they're going away you know what is going to be the impact for that you know what are your clients thinking do they think that you know are they anxious or are they thinking actually this is a really exciting time to innovate and you know move beyond that kind of data yeah, it's a really good question. Let me start off with the opportunity, right? I remember sitting on uh, this stage, well, not this stage, because we're on a virtual stage this year, right? Yeah, uh, another saying, situation of the pandemic. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. That. I remember sitting on the admin stage, probably about two years ago, and actually, because when you think back, two years ago was probably the last actual physical ad week. 
And I was sat on stage and I had to answer a question. It was about what's my thoughts on how we measure and track campaigns in a programmatic and addressable media. And my answer to them was something like, because we are able to track impressions, clicks, land, click-through rate, conversion, dual time, bounce rate, and, and we go on, right? Because we're able to track all of that, what do we do? We track the hell out of everything, because, even when we know it's wrong, right? And I pretty much said that, pretty much word for word, probably about two years ago. And I, I told you that to say this, I actually think there's an opportunity with this disrupt, disruption to really, um, I guess, as an industry, be a bit more considered in how we measure and have a view on uh, past those kind of itty bitty metrics. What is this media that I'm delivering? How is that making an impact on my client's business outcome? We could be a bit more considered. But back to the question around, you know, what our clients thoughts and, you know, what we're doing in this change. And, you know, I want to say this, no one person or organization has all the answers. Let's look at Google with the, with the flock, right? And I actually like the whole idea of the cohort, the, the federated learning of cohort. I, don't, I kind of like the idea of it, but I say no one's got, got all the answers because look, they announced it, but you may have seen some of the press release in the last few, some trade press in the last few weeks is that and that's potentially not fit for purpose in Europe because of GDPR, right? And I think that talks to the very fact that nobody has all the answers. So, you know, let's get this straight, Emma, right? There's going to be a hell of a lot of panels this week that's going to talk about the death of the cookie, what we're going to do about it, the iOS 14 update, privacy confirmed. What, this ain't one of those panels, right? I'm, I'm not your man. It's smart people than me, right? But what I can talk to is, what are we doing? How are we helping our clients in this case? So we've adopted a now and next approach. And the idea around the now and next approach is around, you know, what can we do now, test right now to future proof our clients in this new world? And then what can we do next to test um, um, in this new world to future proof ourselves? And the next is really important because it's going to continue to evolve what we can do, addressable IDs and uh, different sort of um, IDs and, and graphs, etc. It's going to always evolve. And fundamentally, that's what we're doing. And, you know, and with, with both approaches, when it comes to measurement and targeting, you know, we're always going to kind of have conscious marking at the heart of all that we do, taking a deliberate and respectful approach in reaching our consumers. Yeah, I think, I mean, it's absolutely imperative. And I think it's going to be interesting to see how these things play out. I mean, you know, you and I work in programmatic. The cookie has been an incredibly <laughs> valuable asset. You know, for able, you know, for mm -hmm. how we target consumers and how we deliver relevant um, advertising and how we deliver outcomes for our, you know, the brands that are working with us. And I think, you know, as you say, no one has all the answers, but I think it will be a real challenge for those who do step forward and you know innovate and you know change the way that they've been working. And we may even see. I think, I don't know whether you agree, but like a step back and, you know, the, the, the power is going to go back to the most premium content and, you know, publishers to be able to, you know, actually really deliver the most engaging ad solutions to, to the users that they have who are loyal and who are sharing data legitimately. Yeah, potentially. And, you know, I think that's not, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but you still need to have a holistic view of your plan and be able to scale. And I think that's the key. Yeah, yeah I agree. And that sort of leads us into kind of fragmentation, right? You know, the digital advertising ecosystem, there are, it's multifaceted and, you know, I think it can be very um, cluttered and confusing. Um, you know, as Matterkind, you know, how are you navigating that challenge? You know, how do you choose who you're going to work with and why? I think it's a really good question. But in order to understand kind of what, you know, the role of Matterkind and what we do in this space, we really need to answer a question. And that's where this fragmentation happened and why it happened. And kind of before I answer this, I think it's worth taking a step back and I guess putting a disclaimer out there, or more of a statement, and that is that we're all guilty of this fragmentation. And I think all of us, everyone that works in this space, because we don't make it easy, right? Yeah, we don't. Right? Um, and you know, the loom escape is probably the epitome <laughs> of the fragmentation. If you go from left to right on the loom escape, all you see is a whole heap of disjointedness. Am I wrong? No. And um, and then opportunities um, for acquisition. <laughs> opportunities for acquisition. Yeah, yeah, good, good point. And then hopefully break down some of that fragmentation. Yeah. Right? But you know, consider with me for a second. Client side, right? So client side, you sometimes get a display client, a social client, 
a TD client. Sometimes you even get a brand and a DR client. That's fragmentation, right? In the agency, you, you might have a display team, a social team, a AV team, and I can go on. Fragmentation again. The tech partners, some of them have open ecosystems with low walls or no walls. Some of them have closed ecosystems with really high walls. And we've got all these channels, search, social, display, video, native, at home. And a lot of agencies execute in these siloed ways, right? And, you know, all these silos just make it difficult for us to really make, uh, uh, d- make and deliver a meaningful moment for our brands, right? But what brands really need to do is really take an aggressive stance in tearing down those channel silos. And at IPG, you know, we've taken steps in that direction uh, because we've got, a, we've got a couple of proprietary applications, and one, one in particular, where we're able to essentially put one budget, one budget, fluently across all addressable channels and it's optimizing based on that business outcome. So we're not, we're not um, kind of activating this silos. And, you know, as an industry, I think that we need to do a better job at uh, getting past those conceptual storytelling, but actually now starting delivering. They start delivering for our clients. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, there's, it's a you know, very pertinent point, you know, making things efficient, making things transparent you know making things um very clean in terms of who what and why you're doing things and it sounds like you guys are you know making some big inroads and kind of trying to deliver that that type of um i guess education and solution for your brands um and so i guess that sort of leads us into you know why you and i have lots of conversations um supply path optimization you know cleaning up the supply chain and how that has sort of impacted the fragmentation of um the programmatic you know space and you know how how have you guys approached that you know are your clients starting to ask more questions take you know be more involved you know what does it mean and actually you know does it work and ultimately you know are you moving into the next phase of this yeah i think it's a really good topic right the pwc and is our report the supply chain report which i'm assuming you've seen highlighted to client to start having a conversation around supply part, yeah? So whether you actually like the report or you didn't like the report, or you agreed with the content or you disagreed with the content, for me, it, it got the conversation going. And I guess for me, that's a good thing because it's got the conversation going. The challenge I found was that clients across the industry reacted in two ways. First way was around some clients wanted to get a deeper understanding, help me understand my supply part. And then the other reaction was just panic, panic and pandemonium, uh, with a lot of, with the latter being kind of a lot of clients go to, right? And the panic really came from, and I don't think you can necessarily blame the client for this, right? Because the panic really came from two headlines. There was a 15% stat, I think it was about 15%, of an unknown delta. And let me quickly have a real quick random about that unknown delta. I personally, the unknown delta, the, the, the report shouldn't have been released until we got to the bottom of the unknown delta and understand what it was, or to have a real clear point of view on it. Um, and, I, and I've got my thoughts around that, thoughts around that rather. And then the other panic point was that 51%, 51% of working media is all going on working media. So if I heard those two stats as a client, actually, Emma, if you heard those two stats as a client, 50% unknown delta, 51% of your um, uh, advertising dollars is going on working media. Wouldn't that make you panic? Yeah, I mean, I think it, you know, it, a lack of trust is what kind of springs to mind, you know, and wanting to understand exactly what is happening, um, you know, yeah. a very natural response to, to those numbers, I think. No, exactly. So, so for me, um, and I have to admit, I've had a few rants about this. So I'll try not to make this a rant. <laughs> but we really need to get better at understanding the definition of the term working media. Yeah. In the report, it suggests that the end impression on a website is working media. But the very essence of the term working suggests that it's doing something. It's trying to work towards something. It's trying to work towards a goal, a KPI, a ROI. So if you take a step back and you think about, if I think about, what's the last ad that I saw? that really resonated with me. The last ad that I saw resonated with me, glass banisters, right? Random, <laughs> random, I know, but uh, bear with me. So I guess, 
and while it's random, um, I'm a bit of background. I'm currently um, uh, doing my loft conversion, right? And I don't know if you've ever done. I don't know if you've done a loft conversion. Well, have we, you done one before? We did a massive extension uh, just at the beginning of lockdown number one. So uh, we were living okay. on a building site. So I fully empathise with your situation. Okay, so <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not at a business. I'm not at the um, uh, like building site stage at the moment. Mine's a lot of planning. I'm like, okay, so they're starting in about four weeks' time, three weeks actually. Yeah, I'm like, okay. You know, it would be really cool. If I'm doing a loft conversion, it'd be nice having a glass banister here and doing that. Yeah. So, so I I can't remember. Uh, so I was on a review website when I saw it. And I can't for the life of me think of what was the trigger, you know, or why they showed me that ad. Because, you know, when you work in advertising and you see an ad that's I relevant to you, know. you kind of go, oh, I wonder why I'm in the market. You know, I guess I did this, I did that. And um, anyway, so I was in the market. So I saw the ad and I clicked on it. Yes, I'm one of those people that click on that. And I uh, requested a brochure request. But let's take a moment and think, how did they convert me? How did they convert me into that brochure request? They probably paired up with a data company that um, saw that I was in market because I've searched glass banisters, right? Um, they used a DFP so they could get me in real time, right? Um, they probably used a contextual provider to understand that they want to get me in a moment when I'm in market. So not only in market, but in the mindset rather. So hence why they got me in a review website. Um, they might have used uh, a machine learning company, Bolt on that, you know, helps you to do optimization to find when you have your high propensity to purchase. They might have wanted to use a premium SSP, like an OpenX, right? To, um, to you know, get that premium inventory, a little plug there. Right? Um, and then they converted me. But actually, consider with me all the entities that delivered that purchase. There was a DSP, there's a contextual partner, there's a data partner, right? There's a, a machine learning partner. There's, what else did I say? There's a premium SSP, right? So, I, I, and I want to put to you, without a combination of all these entities, you, you could argue that they wouldn't have ever converted me. So really, when you think about working media, it's a combination of all the entities that work towards that business outcome. Yeah, and that's what we need to get. That's what we need to get better at. Absolutely, I think that um, you know we want we want everything, um, and as a consumer, we don't necessarily want to share anything. But if you think all those intermediaries you were talking about, they will also rely on the user um, being active and you know participating in that whole supply chain. You know whether it's sharing data, or whether it's an end act as well. You know, and we have to be thinking about the end to end solution from user yeah. to. You know, <laughs> Yeah, so no, that's no, really, and you know, and not everyone who is going to play a, a role of value. And when they don't, you've got to look at that, right? So when, when I think about what brands should be doing in this space, they need to really understand what is the value of the different players in the supply chain. And that's where SBO comes into, right? And as you should be leaning on your agency partners to really help you in that. And in our IPG, we do that. We, we try to understand what's the value of the players that we can see. In that value chain, and are they adding value, right? It, it, are they adding value, and that's really key. And the second thing I think we we could be looking at um, is how do we deliver premium content? You know, using partners like you to deliver premium content. So, um, and we've recently launched a matter kind creative marketplace, and this is all around how do we how do we um, get the scale of open exchange, but have the uh, I guess content and control of a of a private. Uh, marketplace and we we've got a few created exchange um create marketplaces about five or six um and actually we actually pr'd um, our news one last week which was all around how do you scale premium news uh because typically when you're trying to buy news content um the blunt uh tools on content verification sometimes blocks a lot of that so you know we've, we've recently launched that which i can talk about offline on that or you could just probably google it but um but yeah, so, yeah, it's really I exciting. Think, I think you're, 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 you're right. You know, being able to disseminate the content in a scalable way, but also in a relevant way. You know, where people aren't just making assumptions like news often is, where it's blocked. You know, I think it's, uh, you know, again, it's just another era of change, and you guys are clearly evolving very quickly with that. So, mm -hmm. I guess that leads me very seamlessly onto, you know, what are Matterkind doing 
right now to sort of future proof yourselves you know what do you think is next and what do you need to do to secure your position and you know to win more clients and to deliver your clients the most optimal um i guess client servicing solutions i'll try and answer this in a sentence because i can see we're out of time so i would say being being a human well actually let me make it better being a good human what do i mean by that you know uh, the way we target consumers will change the way we measure and report on our success will change. But the one concept that won't change is that we'll be human. And as, as a human, we need to kind of be deliberate uh, around and be conscious about how we market and our approach to marketing, ensure that we're user centric and that we continue to deliver that right message, that right user at the right time, so we can deliver business outcome for our brand. Yeah, it sounds great. And I think. Um, I guess the final thing is, you know, if there was one piece of advice that you would give to, you know, agencies um, or just people, you know, in our industry right now, you know, what what's next? What is it that we all need to be doing better? Collaborate and integrate. But if there are two words, that is, collaborate and integrate. And I'm talking about with our clients. Collaborate and integrate. The more integrated we, the more integrated we get with our clients, the more we're going to understand their problem and come up with a solution with them. Absolutely. Um, thank you so much, Sean, for taking the time out to talk to me today. Um, it's been really informative and uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of Advertising Week Europe. And, uh, you know, hopefully you and I will catch up again soon, actually in person. Thanks a lot. In person. Thank you so much for having me. It's been brilliant. Awesome.